Hello everyone and welcome back to Chemist Tea Time. Today we are going to be looking at valence bond theory and hybridization. In our last lesson, we looked at the structures that bonded atoms can form. However, we need to take a look at how these bonds are actually formed and to do this, we need to use valence bond theory. Valence bond theory operates off of several principles. The first principle is that bonds form when singly occupied orbitals overlap. Let's look at this in the case for H2. Each hydrogen atom has one electron in the 1s orbital. When these two orbitals overlap, the electrons pair up and a bond is formed. The second principle is that bonding electrons must have different spins. This goes back to the Pauli exclusion principle to make sure bonding electrons don't have identical quantum numbers. The third principle is that bonds will only form when it would lower the potential energy of the system. Otherwise, the bond would be unstable and break. So, we know that orbital overlap is critical to the formation of bonds. However, let's look at beryllium hydride. If we are going based off of valence bond theory, a bond is formed when two half-filled orbitals overlap. When we draw the orbital diagram for beryllium, it does not have two half-filled orbitals to form two bonds. So how is this molecule possible? The answer is hybridization. Hybridization is the mixing of different orbitals, such as the case with S, P, and D orbitals, that allows for bonding electrons to be distributed equally. An analogy that we can use to describe hybridization is by basically throwing all of our orbitals in a blender and mixing them up so they're all the same, keeping in mind that all orbitals will mix unless they are participating in the, a double or triple bond. The first step to determine hybridization is to draw the Lewis diagram and determine the number of electron groups. Next, we draw the orbital diagram of our central atom and if necessary, maximize the number of available electrons by promoting them to a higher orbital. We do this because only unpaired electrons are available to form bonds and we need to form enough bonds to match our Lewis structure. The last step is to hybridize all orbitals except those participating in a double or triple bond. So they are available for bonding. Let's try a few examples. Let's first look at beryllium hydride. When we draw the Lewis structure, it should look like this and we see we have two electron groups. Now let's look at the orbital diagram for beryllium. We see that in the ground state, beryllium has a full s orbital and no unpaired electrons. In order to allow it to bond, we need to promote an electron from the 2s to the 2p orbital, so we now have two unpaired electrons which can form bonds. Finally, we merge the orbitals and name them based on the number of orbitals that hybridize. In this case, we had one s orbital and one p orbital mixing, making this sp hybridized and allowing it to form two bonds. Let's try another one with CH4. Again, we draw the Lewis structure and we see we have four electron groups. When we look at the orbital diagram for carbon, we see that in its ground state, it has a full s orbital and two unpaired electrons in the p orbital. In order to have four bonds, we need to promote an electron from the 2s to the 2p orbital, so we now have four unpaired electrons. We have one s orbital and three p orbitals mixing, making this sp3 hybridized. As a rule of thumb, when determining hybridization, just count the number of orbitals from each shell that were mixed. The last molecule we will look at is PCl5, phosphorus pentachloride. Remember from earlier lessons that phosphorus can have an expanded octet because of the d orbital. We draw the Lewis structure and we see we have five electron groups. When we look at the orbital diagram for phosphorus, we see that in its ground state, it has a full s orbital and three unpaired electrons in the p orbital. In order to have five bonds, we need to promote an electron into the d orbital. So we now have five unpaired electrons. Finally, we merge the orbitals and name them. So we had one s orbital, three p orbitals, and one d orbital, making this sp3 d hybridized. Hopefully, today's lesson was helpful and you were able to understand the processes that lead to the molecular structures that we have discussed in earlier lessons. Until next time, have a wonderful day and thank you for joining us on Chemist Tea Time. Thank you.